service. Well, let me add my welcome to all of you this morning. It's so good to see all of you here with us, especially uh, if you're visiting with us today. Welcome. We're glad to have you here as well, as Drew said. Uh, And if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Greg, and I have the privilege of serving as the pastor, the senior pastor here at Willow Creek. And I want to invite you this morning to turn with me in your Bibles, if you have one, to the book of Philippians. Uh, If you're not familiar where the book of Philippians is, it's kind of towards the back of the the Bible. It's a, a little short shorter uh, book as we began to think about last week. Um, it's, it's really a gigantic thank you card that a man named Paul is writing to a church in a city that is in modern day Greece and a church that he planted and he calls those that are part of that church the saints. And he says to the saints who are there, which are all of the believers in Jesus in that particular church, because we are all saints. He says, I want you to know then remember that God is actually continually working in you, that he has not left you, he has not forsake you, he is doing a mighty work in you, and he will bring it to completion. And so don't don't fret because of what I am going through or don't think it is in vain because of where Paul happens to be, which is in jail in a city called Rome. And he says, as I'm here, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would, you would grow in your love, that it would abound. It would go out to everyone and your love for God would grow and that your love for him would grow as you know Christ more, not just facts and figures about him, but that you, you know him, you experience the love that he has for us that we find in the gospel. And through that, we, we love one another, we care for one another, we grow in the likeness and the image of Jesus as we approve with discernment what is excellent. And so we move now to the second part of Paul's letter to see uh, how it encourages us and challenges us in uh, walking and living as we, we see as the living as the people of God. So let me read for us, beginning of verse 12, and I'm just going to go down to uh, the first part of verse 18. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me is really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Would you pray together with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for a man who believed it, a man who was led by it. And we thank you for how you spoke through him. And Lord, I pray that as we think this morning about living as your people, as living as the saints, that you would help us, even as we confessed a little while ago, that you would help us to take our eyes off of ourselves, look unto you, and to have our beings transformed by the grace of Jesus. Lord, I, I can't do that simply with anything that I will say, but you can. And so we ask that you would speak to us this morning, and we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. I have some uh, sad news to report this morning, and that is that I lost the staff fantasy football league. It's heartbreaking, uh, begrudging congratulations to Pastor Drew, who beat me. We don't need to clap for that. Um, that's, too, that's too painful. Um, he, he beat me in the championship game. I, I, I had a really good team this year. Uh, I began the year and the name of my team was not going to win. And after I was just smoking people right and left, I changed the name of my team to go ahead and give me the trophy. 
because we really do have a trophy for the winner of the Willow Creek Staff Fantasy Football League. Now, if you have no idea what fantasy football is, I didn't either until about two years ago. When, when I moved here and the staff had, had an established league going. So here's what fantasy football is in a nutshell, and I'm trying not to confuse you or divert from the word of God, but here it is. You, as, you, as, as an individual, you form a league with people, and then you go and you draft, you pick players who actually play football like for a living in the National Football League. And you pick uh, a quarterback and a running back and a tight end and some wide receivers and a defense and a kicker. And the other people in your league are also picking people. And so that forms your team. And you get points based on how those people, those players do in an actual game. So a pass and a rush and a catch and a touchdown and a field goal and sacks and all all that stuff has points that go along with it. You, as the the person that's, that's your team, you don't actually do anything. You just sit there and you watch the points come in and then if you're like our staff, you go to the Willow Creek staff trash talk group text And you talk about how you have changed your name to go ahead and give me the trophy. It changes the way I watch a game. Because the game no longer is about the team that I root for. Because I used to be able to go and to sit and to watch the Ravens because I lived right outside of Baltimore and I, I, that, that became kind of our team and I'd watch the Ravens play and I'm like, yay, we won, we're a team. Now with fantasy football, it doesn't matter if your team wins or loses. I will, my kids will attest to this. Please don't ask them after the service, but they will tell you yes, that I will sit there and yell at the television on Sunday evenings, give the ball to 88. Why, dad? You could care less about the Cleveland Browns. Because he's my receiver. Because I need the points. Because I'm losing. And the game that you're watching is no longer about that team doing well. It becomes about you. So much so that people who are really into fantasy football like go online after the games and like berate the players that are on their team because they didn't score enough points or because they got injured and they couldn't play. And some even go to the level of going to the games, the actual physical NFL game, and when their player doesn't do well, they'll meet them outside the stadium like when they're walking to the bus or to their car and start yelling at them. Because this person who makes millions of dollars to play this really difficult game professionally didn't get this person enough points. And there's YouTube clips about it of players like yelling at these folks, the folks like me, going, I don't play for your fantasy team. Uh, That's not what this is about. But what fantasy football does is it makes it about me. It makes it about the individual, not no longer about the team. And I think in some ways, you know, that's kind of the quintessential American thing that we've taken this game that we watch and is kind of a cultural thing for us here in America, the NFL, and we've found a way to not make it about the team that we're rooting for, even though in some ways that's still there, but we've turned it and made it about us about me as an individual, because that's the air that we breathe. That's our culture. It's all about what's in it for me. What do I get out of it? What, what good is it if you, if you win, but I don't? What's in it for me? And we can take that idea and we can bring it into our lives as the people of God and say, as I'm living as the people of God, what does this have to do about me? What do I get out of it? 
And what the Apostle Paul is going to exemplify for us here in these few verses in the book of Philippians is a man who is living in the freedom of the mission of God in the world. He is a man who understands that God has a mission in his world to save sinners from their sin, to offer grace to those who are in their sin, because there is no way for us to be made right with God except through Jesus. And the way that that comes is through his church proclaiming it. And God has a mission that he has a church to, to, to accomplish. And so Paul says, I'm living in that freedom. And here's what it's done. It's freedom from himself. It's freed us from fear. And it frees us from competition. That's what we're going to look at this morning and think about as we live as the people of God on the mission of God in the world, living free from self, free from fear, and free from competition. Freedom from self. As Paul is writing this letter, he is literally in prison. Uh, it's not a prison like you might think. It's in a, he's in a, a rental house, basically, where he is uh, chained literally to another person. He's chained to a Roman guard. People can kind of come in and out and talk with him and he can write letters and he can do a few things. But he, in some ways, he has a captive audience. Not that he's the captive, but he's got someone who is chained to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the, the, the verses here, he says, I want you to know, verse 12, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. The word there for imperial guard is in, in Greek is the word praetorian. The praetorian were a certain section of soldiers in the Roman Empire. There were 9,000 men who were a part of the praetorian. They were the best of the best. They were handpicked. They were the special ops, the seals, the rangers, the, the cream of the crop of Roman soldiers. And when they weren't out fighting, what they did, they, they would always have a detachment in Rome, and their job was to guard, to be the bodyguard for Caesar and to guard Caesar's prisoners. And so Paul is chained to one of these men. They worked in six-hour shifts. And Paul says to the people in Philippi, you know what? Every one of them knows I'm here for Jesus. Because when they get chained to me, I tell them. <laughs> I, I have a captive audience. They cannot go away. And so it has become known he doesn't say they've, become, they've all become believers. He just says they, they know about this. They know why I'm here. I present the gospel to them. But this was not Paul's plan. This was not what Paul had dreamed up. Because Paul's desire, it, it was, he did desire to go to Rome at one point. He says, as he's writing the letter to the Romans that we have here in the Bible, he says, I, I want to come and visit you. I haven't visited you bec yet because I, I've been holed up in other places, but I want to come. And it's not because I'm ashamed of the gospel at all, which was the rumor going around that Paul's not going to Rome because he's ashamed of the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of that. Because that's the power of God that saves you and me. But I desire to come to you and to preach the gospel to you. But Paul made a, a journey to Jerusalem where he was arrested. And they started to, to get ready to beat him. Literally, like physically beat him. Where he looks at the guards while he's getting ready to be beaten. And he goes, hey, I just want you to just ask a question. Like, is it? Is it legal for you to beat a Roman citizen? And the guards kind of went, oh, ruh -roh. <laughs> no, uh, no, actually, it's not. And so Paul says, I'm actually, I want to appeal to Caesar. And so that begins what turned out to be a two-year journey, almost two-year journey from Jerusalem to other parts of the Roman Empire where he would spend various amounts of time, which would lead him to uh, being on a ship that was shipwrecked, which would lead him to being bitten by a poisonous snake 
where the folks there thought, oh, this guy's really done something bad. You must be a really, really bad sinner because you, as soon as you got off the shipwreck, you got bitten by a poisonous snake. And so the gods must think, well, if the shipwreck didn't kill you, the snake is going to, and the snake bite didn't have any effect on Paul. So he went from this guy who was like, oh, you're the worst of the worst. And then they're like, he's alive. He's a deity. And they start worshiping him. And he's like, no, 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 neither, neither. And finally, after a couple of years, he makes his way to Rome, which is where we find him when he's writing this book to the Philippians. And he, he had longed actually to make his way all the way to Spain. He, he desired to go to what to them would have been the ends of the earth, to Spain, to preach the gospel to those there. And now all of his plans have been thwarted. He hasn't made it to Spain He's in Rome, he's under arrest, he's not able to see and to preach at the church there in Rome, and yet he goes, even though all my plans, everything that I've come up with that I wanted to do, you know, this is, I'm going to rejoice in this. I'm going to rejoice in this because do you see what's happened, church at Philippi? What God has actually done is he's given me this in into a group of people that I probably never would have had an in with with the gospel had it not been for this. That these hardcore Roman soldiers whose life is just built on being the biggest and the baddest, they're chained to me and they're hearing the gospel. And we, we see over in chapter 4, verse 22, and, and it's one of those verses at the end of Paul's letter that if you're anything like me, I just call them like the Chick-fil-A fry leftover verses. You know those little pieces of fries at the bottom of your Chick-fil-A box and you just kind of pour them all into one hand and just take them all at once because it just doesn't, there's nothing much to it, but it's still there. And that's what I, how I read those last verses of greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, say hi to Timothy for me, do this. And you just kind of read through that real quick. Well, when we do that, we miss this, that he says, the members of Caesar's house greet you as well. He says, not just that the gospel has gone to these soldiers, but that there are members of the leadership of the Roman empire in Caesar's own household who have come to faith and they say hello. And Paul says, why I'm here is not for me. I'm here for the mission of God. And I find myself in this place that I, I didn't want to be, that it wasn't part of my plan, but life is not about me. We can see how he is just freed from himself and says, here's where I'm at. I don't like it. I don't, don't really want to be here. But while I'm here, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell the people around me about Jesus. I wonder for us, how often do we see the things of life that are frustrating or the plans that are ruined or the, the dreams that we had that don't come to fruition and we, we long for those things and, and we go, woe is me, rather than seeing where God has me right now is actually an opportunity to share the gospel with the people around me. You see, self says, woe is me. Freed from self says, this must be an opportunity to share Jesus with others. Self says, why can't they get my windows right Freed from self says, maybe because you keep going to the store and why don't you share Jesus with these people that you're getting to know? But I'll be honest with you, I'm more about myself and let's just get the windows in. And then God brings about a passage like this and says, what are you doing Here's a, kind of a diagnostic question. You can, you can write it down. I, I think it might be in our online bulletin under the questions for our message. Just think about this in your own mind. If you don't get fill in the blank, but get to tell others about Jesus, would you be content? Would you rejoice? 
Would you be glad? It doesn't mean that we don't miss whatever we filled in the blank is, but would you be content? Would you rejoice? If you didn't get married, if you didn't have children, if you didn't see your grandchildren, if you didn't get that promotion, if you didn't get to live in that neighborhood that you really wanted to live in, if you didn't get the, the, long, the long years of life that you wanted, if you didn't get fill in the blank, but you got to tell others about Jesus, would you be content? Self says no. Freedom from self in the gospel and the mission of God says, yes. And I would say before you as your pastor, that that is a great struggle, not for me and maybe for you. Would I be content if I didn't get these things? I don't know. But the opportunity to share Jesus with others. But he goes kind of beyond that in verse 14. He says, as, as I'm here, as I'm per- proclaiming this gospel to the people around me who are literally chained to me, um, and they know that my imprisonment is for Christ. Verse 14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He says, not just for me, but what this has actually done is that it has freed many of the brothers and the sisters, um, that that word kind of covers both, Um, it has freed others to go and to share the good news of Jesus. Because oftentimes we live in fear. When When we live for self, fear is almost inevitable, I think. When it's for self and I'm afraid of what someone's going to think of me if I tell them about Jesus. What are you going to say to me? What are you going to do to me? Are you going to to leave? Because I really want to be your friend. I really want to be a part of that group. I really want to be a part of that that club or whatever it is. But if I tell you about Jesus, then you're going to reject me. And so I don't. And so, so I live in fear. But what Paul says is that Actually, what what has happened is that many, most of the folks that are part of the church here in Rome that were living in fear because of the gospel are now proclaiming it. They've become confident in the Lord, not in themselves, not in their ability. Paul didn't have like a weekend conference where he's like, all right, guys, I'm going to give you some principles on evangelism. Not that those are wrong, but they watched him in jail. They watched him as he was tied. I mean, he, he literally, and we'll look at this, Pastor Drew's gonna talk about this next week in the, in the message. He, he literally does not know the outcome of what's going to happen to him. He could die the next day. He could be set free and on his way to Spain. He does not know. And as others are watching him, they say, if Paul can do that, certainly I can go to the marketplace and share with my neighbors, with my friends about this Jesus. Because look what he's doing. There's something about seeing someone else go before you that encourages us, that strengthens us, that demonstrates to us, like, this is what the Lord is doing. And we see it and we're encouraged by it. But so often we live in fear. And if you live in fear, just like me, we're not the first We're not the first and we definitely won't be the last to live in fear. I think of way, 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 way back, a guy named Moses. A guy named Moses who I tend to think, I mean, one, I tend to think he looks a lot like Charlton Heston. Um, If you're younger, YouTube it, okay? It's Ten Commandments movie. Ask someone with the gray hair of wisdom that Pastor Drew mentioned. Um, Moses killed a man with his bare hand, and he ran away. He ran away, and he fled Egypt, and he's out with a flock of sheep that belong to his father-in-law, and he sees this bush over on the side, and it's burning, and he's like, well, that's, that's weird. Let me take a look at it, and so he gets closer to it, and the voice out of the bush goes, Moses, Moses, how does this bush know my name? And it's God speaking to him. 
And God says to him, Moses, here's what you're going to do. I've seen my people. I've seen the Israelites. I've seen them in their slavery in Egypt. And I've heard their cry. The end of chapter 2 of Exodus, God says, God saw, he knew. He knew what was going on in their slavery. And he says to Moses, years later, I've seen it. I know it. Moses, you're going to be the one that's going to go and pull them out. And Moses goes, um, sorry, what? <laughs> um, who? You are Moses. But what if they ask me who sent me? What do I say to them? Tell them I am who I am. I am has sent me. Oh yeah, but what if they don't believe me? Moses, pick up the stick. Ah, turn it into a snake. Throw the snake down. Ah, turn it into a stick. Take the stick with you. Show it to them. Stop being afraid. I'm with you. And 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 Moses and, and, Mo, and Moses Moses goes, but 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 I, but I, but I stutter. I, I I have a I have a I have a thing when I, when I when I talk. When I talk to people, it just doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't come out. Moses, I'm with you. Stop thinking about all the, the fear. I'll send your brother Aaron with you. You'll do it together. And he goes. And seeing that I'm not the only one who's afraid, it encourages us that many have been afraid, but God is with them and he is with us because we are the saints who've been called to follow him. I, I had the privilege of going uh, to a, a country. When we lived in Maryland, we had a, this family in our church. They sat right down front and they sat there for a couple of years before anybody talked to them. And so we got to know them and they actually had a a church planting ministry in a country in Southeast Asia where it is not illegal to be a Christian, but it is illegal to tell others about Jesus. And so he's like, do you want to come and see? No. Come and see. So me and the pastor, we go over and we see their ministry. And they have thousands of people who live in this country where it is unsafe to be a Christian not illegal, but it is unsafe. And he said, we're going to meet tomorrow with three of my evangelists. That when people come to faith, we train them, we equip them, and then we send them out to go to a, a town, a village, someplace, and to proclaim the gospel. And so we're driving through this jungle, and we end up like on a durian plantation in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, what are, what are we doing here? And the man who runs it goes, this is where we'll be safe oh, okay, I didn't feel unsafe, but I do now. And so we sat in the middle of this open air gazebo in the middle of the tropics for like three hours on a broken concrete floor and listened to three men tell what they do on a daily basis. When I leave my home, I tell my wife I love her and that if I die today, I'll see her in heaven. And I hug my kids tight and say, if I die today, I will see you in heaven. And then I go to the market and to the village and to the train station and the bus station and wherever else that people will listen and I tell them about Jesus. And you want to see, here's this, this scar. This is where the guy attacked me with a machete about three months ago. And my family had to flee to this house. And I left there and I looked at the guy I was with and went, we're not very good at this, are we? We're, I'm, I'm afraid of what the person next door is going to think that I really never talked to. And their life is worth nothing if only the gospel gets to go forth because they're freed from self and they're freed from fear. And I want to say that just those three hours encouraged me so much to say, stop living in your fear. And it says to you, stop living in your fear on the mission of God I think that, that fear, is, if we think of the mission of God to redeem people in the world as kind of a road, I think one ditch is fear on one side of the road. 
He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to tell others about Jesus because of fear, this ditch. The other side of that is competition. And that's where Paul goes in these last verses in 15 to 18. He said, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. What Paul is saying here, in, in, in some ways, is it's absolutely remarkable. It's remarkable in some ways in that people were trying, pastors were trying to be better than Paul. Like, he's in jail, and kind of everybody knew it, and they're going, oh yeah, you think you're such a good pastor, church planter. Watch this. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Hey, Paul, I got 100 converts today. You only got 50. <laughs> Loser. And he, he has people that are competing with him. I think that's astonishing. Until I realize, like, my own heart. But he says this, where he's freed from competition. He, he's not saying that they're not preaching the gospel. He, he doesn't go, he's not, this isn't Galatians, where they're not preaching the gospel. And he calls them out and says, those that have come in, they are not preaching the gospel. They are preaching works righteousness that you can make your way to heaven because of what you do. That's not what they're preaching. They are preaching the good news of Jesus, that we are saved by his grace and mercy alone, that his life, death, and resurrection is, is ours that he rose from the dead and, and his rising from the dead is ours too. And we have that confidence. We are the saints. He is saying that the people that are coming to faith through them and they themselves are believers in Jesus. But here's their motive. They're doing it for themselves. They're doing it to make me look bad. And here's my words to them in prison. Awesome. Wonderful. Jesus' name is going forth. If they're just trying to make me look bad, go for it. As long as people are coming to faith in Jesus, knock yourself out. If I'm nothing, I don't care because he's freed from himself. And it's not a competition that, oh, I have to be better than, than this pastor or this church has to be better than that church. And yet for me, I've struggled with this at the risk of making this about me in a sermon about freed from self. But anyway, um, it's a struggle of mine. Ever since seminary, ever since seminary where we had preaching classes and you sit down in a room with eight other guys and one of them, each class, preaches a message to seven. And here's what you see as the one who is preaching. You never see their face. All you see is a balding head because they're critiquing you. They're writing things down. They're grading you. They're judging you, trying to help you get better. And I remember sitting in that room going, oh man, he's good. Wow, he's good. Where did he get that from that? Oh my, that's good. And also sat there some weeks and went, oh, I'm so much better than this guy. Oh man, I'm good. He'll never amount to anything. Why is he even here? I'm somewhere in the middle. Isn't that lovely? My first past job, and I was in student ministry and I got to pastor, or I got to preach like every couple of months. And a strange thing happened after I preached and that the senior pastor's wife came up and told me how I did. And that was weird. It was bizarre. That was pretty good. Thank you, I guess. But something weirder happened. That the pastor had a lot of friends who wrote books and had podcasts and were big online and all this kind of stuff. And he invited them in to preach. And so they would come in and they would preach and the senior pastor's wife would come find me afterwards to tell me whether I was better or worse than them. 
And it became this competition to me. Like when I planned a message, I thought, how can I make her go, you were better than so-and-so who wrote the book. You were, you're better. It became this competition for me to be better than someone else. When we were in Scotland working with a mission agency, we had a, another mission agency that does amazing, wonderful work in the world that said, we're going to come and start a work in Scotland. And my answer to them was, no, you probably shouldn't because we're here. We've got this. We're good. Go away. We don't need you. Because it was, I saw it as a competition. Mark Nelson, who many of you might remember, uh, he was an intern with us last year, um, planting a church in Chuliota. Chuliota is kind of, you go through Oviedo and just keep going until you get to the horses. Um, that's Chuliota. He's planting a church out there. Mark met with a pastor of a church that's nearby, but not in Chuliota. And he came after he had this lunch with him and he's like, can I just tell you how that lunch went? I was like, yeah, absolutely. He's like, that guy doesn't like me. I was like, what makes you say that? Because he doesn't want us planting a church in his turf. And, I'm, and I start going, like, I said, like, come on, man, you got, like, kingdom thinking, like, there's enough in this and that and all these, and I'm just railing against this guy who I've never met. I've, I, know, I know nothing about him. I know nothing about his church. And I'm, there, he's a brother in Christ. I do know that. And I'm railing against him. And boy, I felt better about myself after that. But two weeks ago, I left here on January the 7th after the morning worship, drove, was driving home, just right down the street from us here, um, at the corner of East Lake and Tuscawilla, I saw these blue signs in the, on the side of the road that said, welcome home, glad you're here, such and such a church starting today. And I see all these people out in the parking lot like waving at me in blue shirts. Hey, welcome, come to our church. And as soon as I got home, I looked them up. And here's what I thought. What are you doing on our street? This is, the, not this street, this, there's enough churches on East Lake, people. Go away. Not on, not on our turf. And suddenly I was the man I was railing against three months ago. And they believe the gospel 400 yards that way. And there is enough to do in our community for the sake of the gospel, where we could have a church at every house all the way around here and still not have enough to reach this community for Jesus. Because we're not in competition with them. Do we differ on some things that we believe that the Bible says? Yes. Do we agree with the essence of the gospel that it is by grace through faith? Absolutely. And so let's plant more. Let's have more that come so that people would hear the good news of Jesus because it's not about me. It's not about the church down the street. It's about his kingdom moving in the world and people coming to faith and lives being redeemed and people who are broken finding the hope that is in Jesus, finding life and joy and peace. It's about marriages being restored, parents loving their children, the, the things of this world that are broken as we begin to pray, God, make the things that are in heaven, may they be on earth now and give us a part in, in doing that, the redemption of all things that Jesus is ultimately bringing about. He says, I have a church for that as the saints of God, and that's you, and that's me. And the, the, the task is too big for us, but it is not too big for him. And he says, here's what I want you to do. As the people of God, take your eyes off of yourself. Don't be afraid. Don't be in competition. But as the people of God, as the saints, Go forward on the mission of proclaiming the gospel. And wherever God has us, whether it's where we want to be or not, he says, that's where I want you to be. And so it's an opportunity for you to share and to tell others 
about the hope that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the saints of Willow Creek and for the saints down the street and for the saints all over our community that are proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would free us from ourselves. I pray that first and foremost, selfishly for me, but for all my friends here. Lord, free us from ourself and from fear and from thinking that we have to somehow maybe become a mega church or do this thing because someone else is doing it. Lord, we're not in competition. But Lord, we long to see people's lives changed by the gospel, starting with us. And so Lord, change us by your gospel. Strengthen us in the Lord as the brothers and sisters were in Rome as they saw Paul in prison. So Lord, would you strengthen us as we go from this place to live in light of being the saints? Would you free us from our fears, encourage us, and Lord, would you grow your church here in Seminole County and across Central Florida and to the ends of the earth? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.